Hello everyone and welcome to Gospel Life online service today. We thank God um, that we are able to um, listen once again to the word of God through this medium. We also thank God that our government has found it okay for our gatherings to resume. Um, we will be resuming our physical gatherings, but for now we have still found it important and worthy for us to still hear the word of God brought to us through through this kind of media. And so wherever you are, please um, sit down, get your Bible, you know, set it down and let us spend uh, some time listening to the word of God explained to us. Let me pray and then we will get back to where we stopped uh, last week. Father God, we thank you so much that we can uh, gather like this um, in our houses, um, in our cars, um, in our places of work and wherever we are. We, we are grateful that we can hear the gospel explained to us um, wherever we are through technology. And thank you because your word gives light. Your word is powerful. It comes to heal us. It comes to restore us. It comes to give us renewal. As we, as we look um, into it today and this morning, we pray that you will speak to us and encourage us and instruct us and rebuke us and correct us and train us for righteousness because that's what your word comes to do to us and for us. We thank you for every listener from whatever part of the world uh, they are. We pray for them, especially in moments like this when, when you, literally everyone is stressed up and there is so much happening. We, we pray that, Lord, you will strengthen us and, and comfort us and encourage us. Uh, in your name and for your glory, and that we will not forget that it is the gospel that is the power of God that saves us from every, everything and everywhere and every situation and every circumstance. We pray that that will be real in our lives even this morning. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, we, we are doing a series on faith and repentance. We are doing a, a series on gospel renewal and we began last week and we introduced the topic, we introduced the series. And one of the things we said, or we came to a conclusion that for us to experience renewal, for us to be able to experience revival and restoration, we must be people of faith and repentance. That's how we ended last week. And today I want us to go further and begin to talk about faith and repentance. What do we mean by these two words? These are two religious words and, and you know, we use them, you know, almost every day in our, in our religious talk uh, to such an extent that um, the meaning of these two words, very powerful words, has been, has been lost, has been eroded by, you know, the, 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 the religion that we carry with every, every single day. Today, I want us to get into the meaning of these words and begin to think through what they mean biblically and what they mean for us practically. Because that's, that's what we need to do for us to be able to experience renewal and for us to be able to begin once again to be happy about Jesus, happy about the gospel, and, and, and practically walk in ways that we can, we can show that we are men and women of the gospel. We need we need a redefinition of these words for our day, for our generation, in a manner that uh, in a manner that we begin to understand what God wants us to do and to be in our day and in our time. So faith and repentance. We said I ended by saying last last Sunday that faith and repentance are two great gifts from God. It is God who gives us faith to believe. And it is God who gives us the gift of repentance. Unless God is merciful enough to give us faith in order to believe, 
and repentance in order to turn away from where we have been, turn away from our sin, turn away from our rebellion, unless God gives us that. We cannot work it out by ourselves, by our own strength. We cannot. That's why uh, last, last Sunday we talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, we say he convicts us. He tells us something about God. He tells us something about our sin. He tells us something about God's righteousness. He tells us something about God's coming judgment. And so we need the Holy Spirit to help us. But you realize that the Holy Spirit works hand in hand with the word of God. So without, without the Holy Spirit, we don't have the word of God. Without the word of God, we don't have the Holy Spirit. And so we need the Holy Spirit to help us in the process of our believing and our, our, our repentance. So faith, so faith and repentance are two great gifts from God. A person cannot say they trust, they have faith in God, and they don't turn away from their ways. A person cannot say, I am turning for, away from my ways and not be a person of faith or even a person who trusts in the Messiah. And so today, I want us to spend some time thinking about, about, about what it means to be people of faith and what it means to be people of repentance. So what is the meaning of these two words? Once again, we said last Sunday that there are two signs of the of the coin of gospel renewal. So you cannot say you have one and you do not have the other. Faith and repentance, we say, are the prerequisites of a true renewal. And we need them. A true new, a true, for a true renewal to happen, we need to be people of uh, faith and people of repentance. But you also realize that many people have wrongly understood these two concepts. For example, when it comes to faith, many people wrongly believe that trusting in Christ is some sort of irrational commitment against reason or even evidence or even common sense. So for, for many people, faith and common sense don't rhyme. They don't come together. For many people, you cannot be both a rational human being and a man of wisdom, a woman of wisdom. So for many people, there's a disconnect there. And that's why, that's why you will find that uh, many times faith is meaningless. Even for many Christians out there, they don't know how to work out life at the marketplace. How faith works out. They don't understand that. Why? Because when they look at faith and they look at, they look at reason, they see these two do not merge. And that's wrong. We need to be consistent with what the Bible, what the Bible teaches. Other people think that faith is believing against evidence, but that's not true. That's not true. Why? Okay, and because of that, they focus on themselves other than focusing on the object of faith himself, which is Jesus Christ. So when somebody thinks and believes that belief has got nothing to do with evidence. So for me to be a person of faith, I don't need to consider evidence, whether that evidence is historical or even scientific. It makes that person only think about themselves and not think about Jesus Christ, who is the object of our faith. Another example, if you walk to many bookstores today, all over the place. You will find so many books uh, written about the subject of faith. But when you read those books, many times you find, in fact, those books are not talking about faith. What is there? You, find, you will find faith nuggets. You will find motivational talks. You will find motivational speech. And they pass out as, they pass out as, as, as faith. But they are not they are not. They are not speaking about faith. They are speaking about something else. It's just simple motivation. It's simple encouragement that is not coming from the word of God. That is something that you find that is very common with Christians today. For others, faith is growing up in a Christian home. And so you hear people saying, I grew up in a Christian home. My father was Christian. My mother was Christian. My grandparents, my grandparents were pastors. And so for many people, to be a man or woman of faith is to be born in a Christian home. 
is to have a Christian heritage. But I want to say this morning that to be a man or woman of faith is not to have a Christian heritage. Maybe it may be good that you have learned the Bible from your forefathers, people who have come before you. But to have a Christian heritage is not to be a man or woman of faith. It is not to be saved. In fact, somewhere, the, somewhere Paul will say he was circumcised on the eighth day. He will say he belongs to the people of Israel. He will say he is of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. But what does Paul do with that heritage? He calls it rubbish. He realizes that that is not true faith. It cannot save him. In other words, his heritage cannot give him salvation. His heritage cannot give him true renewal. His heritage cannot give him um, proper faith for him to be able to trust in Jesus Christ and to repent. Another example for many people out there, faith has got no relationship with repentance. Okay? What does that mean? You may hear people say that they believe what the Bible says. But when you compare that to their practices, you realize that there is, there, is, there is no consistency. There is no coherence. Why? Because what they believe and what they practice is totally different. For faith to be true faith, then what is confessed with our mouth and with our hearts must be what we practice when we do things with our hands, with our minds, with our eyes. With our minds, we think what we have been taught as true faith. With our hands, we practice what we have been taught to be the true word of God, to be the true faith. And so for many people, there is no connection between faith and repentance. There is no connection between what they believe and whether they are turning away from what they believed before or not. And that disconnect needs to be addressed for us to be able to become people of faith. So when you come, when it comes to faith and repentance, these are two gifts that we must go back into the Bible, rediscover them for our day, and begin to live a life that is addressed by the word of God, because it is the word of God that gives us faith. We begin to live a life of repentance because when, when, because when the word of God comes to us, when the word of God speaks to us, it demands a change of mind, a change of actions. And so most Christians have not been taught how to renounce old ways and old mentalities and old methods and old schemes, old attitudes and dispossessions, old world views. Many Christians have not been taught that. And so they think repentance is just feeling sorry. And so when you tell people in church to repent, many times people begin to pray. Okay? When you ask people to repent, many times people go into a sorrowful state. And they begin to talk to God and tell God, you know, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. But what you realize is many times, many people do not go beyond that. Because that is just halfway the repentance process. Repentance involves sorry, being sorry for sin. But that's just the beginning. There is much more that happens when someone repents of their sins. There's much more. Okay? True repentance goes much deeper. Okay? Yes, it involves asking for forgiveness. It involves going to God and talking to him about where you have gone wrong, but it goes deeper to a change of mind, to a change of disposition, to a change of attitude. It, it, it goes deeper to a change of direction. Yes, forgiveness of sins, but then you don't go back into that world. You don't go back to that sin. You turn and begin to walk in the ways that God demands for all of us. So, so faith and repentance involves a change, a change of heart, a change of attitude, a change of mind. And all these things cannot happen unless we return 
to the word of God because it is the word of God that addresses what we should think about and what we should do. And so repentance is not something you do once and then you walk happy and clappy the rest of your life. No, repentance is, or real repentance is an everyday deal. True repentance must be accompanied by faith. And that faith is full reliance on Christ, who is the object of our faith. Once again, in our day and time, if you tune on to the so many TV stations that we have all over, um, you will hear a lot of preaching, okay? But many times that preaching does not go deeper to a place whereby people begin to appreciate the, the place of faith and repentance in their lives. In fact, many times that preaching has got to do with our itching ears. Mostly you find promises of other things in the name of faith. And over and over again, what we hear is it's basically testimony. So people will come and they will testify. But what are these testimonies about? These testimonies are about, say, a businessman who turned to Jesus and then his business thrived. He got double profits or even triple profits. And we hear that advertised as faith. What else do you hear? We hear of a woman who for many years waited to be married and they could not find someone to marry them. But then somewhere along the way, they turned to Jesus and finally a man arrived, I don't know from heaven or from somewhere, and they are now married. And that is given as a testimony of faith. But is that true? Okay, we won't get into that. What other testimonies do we hear? We are of a man who has been waiting for a promotion, has been working hard and waiting for a, prom for a promotion for many years. And finally, that man turns to Jesus. And then now, everybody is celebrating because that man has just become a CEO. And that is associated with faith. And the question is, is that true faith? Is that true faith? In fact, for many, if you don't show these, these things, if you don't, you don't seem to have these kind of testimonies, you look like your relationship with Jesus has got a problem. You look like you are not spiritual enough. In fact, you are told to do something more. Give some money. Pray more. Wake up early in the morning and, uh, and pray and, uh, and speak in tongues and sing a song and read your Bible three or four times a day. Maybe because through that, people think that uh, they will begin, their faith will increase and their faith will be fruitful. But is that true? Is that what the Bible teaches? That's the question we need to ask. So by this time, you already have taken, you, by that time you are being asked to give more or to devote yourself more or to, to pray more. By that time, your eyes are already off Jesus and you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your money. You're thinking about your marriage. You're thinking about where to get the next car, where to build your, to build your next house. So your eyes are no longer on Jesus. They have moved. Your eyes are on you and the things that you want in life. And I want to submit to us today that faith has primarily to do with Jesus and not what you need. Faith has primarily to do with our love and our reception of Jesus Christ in our lives and not our needs. Faith has got more to do with our, our understanding and our knowing of who Jesus is, what he needs of me, what he requires of me, than meeting my own personal needs. And that's what, that's what we will, I would, I'm just about to read scriptures now. And that's what we will discover. True biblical faith is not about us. It's not about our needs. It's not about our pain and suffering and how we can get out of it. Faith and repentance is not about our prosperity or even our poverty. True biblical faith is about God. It's about Jesus. It's about our knowledge of him. It's about, it's, about, it's about how God knows us 
and how we know him through his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, one can say that the whole Bible, the whole Bible is a book about faith. Because in the Bible, God is reaching out to us, giving us faith so that we may repent. And by repent, we turn back to him and begin to accomplish his will and his purposes here on earth. The whole Bible is about that. The whole Bible is about that. And so the Christian faith, a true biblical faith, is something that is active. It's not passive. It's something that, that is happening in your heart, in your mind. True biblical faith is an attitude that we must bear, that we must have. It is a relationship, okay? But it's also a relationship that is based on something that is, that is, that we call an object of our faith. And the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. It's not the things that we think we want. It's not the things that we think we need. The object of our faith is Jesus. And so true faith is the result, is a result of a face-to-face -face encounter with the Son of God. True faith comes about because you have encountered the resurrected Jesus Christ, the resurrected Son of God. And for us to be men and women of faith, once again, we must rediscover this person. We need to know this, this person, and we need to know what he has taught to be true repentance and true faith. Once again, true faith is a, is a complete abandonment of one's life to the direction and control of the Lord and the, and the control by the Lord himself, by his spirit, by his word. True faith is confident trust that exists between a man and his savior. I want to read some scriptures so that, so that we may find what I am teaching in the word of God. Because if it is not based in the word of God, then we don't have any right to believe it. And I found myself thinking about, thinking about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. So they arrived in Philippi. They preached the gospel to Lydia. They preached the gospel to a young woman there, a young girl who is possessed of demons. Okay? And then as a result of preaching the gospel, they land into trouble. They find themselves in jail. They are jailed. And at night, they are singing and they are praising God. Okay? In trouble, but they are singing and praising God at night. And suddenly, the prison doors are open and they are free. And they, they begin to walk out. But as they walk out, the jailer, the person who is in charge of jail, realizes that the prison doors are open and the prisoners are escaping, the prisoners are walking out. And he wants to kill himself. He wants to kill himself. He wants to harm himself. Of course, he thinks if this happens, the government, my authorities, will destroy me by tomorrow morning. And so before he is destroyed by the authorities, he decides he should destroy himself. But Paul and Cyrus stop this man and they tell him, no, you cannot hurt yourself. And then this man asks a question right there in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. He asks, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, for many of us, when, we, when that question is asked, we quickly think about salvation from our sin, salvation from our rebellion, salvation from, um, you know, the evil and wickedness. But I don't think that this is what this man is looking at, is looking at or I don't think this is, what, this is what this man is thinking about at that particular moment. He realizes that he's in trouble and he asks Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? To be saved from what? To be saved from the present trouble that is happening right there. And Paul and, Ty and, Paul and Cyrus profaned an answer. And this is what they say. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And the one believed there is the one for faith. Okay, so on Sunday I say the word faith and the word believe in the English are two different words. Okay, but in the Greek it's, it's, it's one word. Faith is the noun, believe is the verb. And so, and so Paul and Silas, they tell the jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So the answer and the solution to this man's predicament is faith. It's belief, it's trust, it's a confident trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what will save him. And so faith comes in hardy. Faith comes in as the instrument that this man requires so that he may be saved eternally, but also from the present predicament that he is facing at that particular moment. What about John in the John's gospel? So in, in, in the, the word belief, the word belief, John never uses the word faith as a noun. But the whole gospel uses the word believe about 98 times. And so in the, in the gospel of John, the word believe, the word for faith is, is, is active, is a verb. Okay? Faith is not passive for John. Faith is something that, that is happening. Faith is something that is active. Hollow is happening. And so when we go into that gospel, right in the beginning, in chapter 1, John speaking about, about Jesus, or John writing about what Jesus uh, uh, is and who is in chapter 1. He was the, in the beginning was the one, and the one was with God, and the one was, was, was God. Right there in verse 11 and 12, he says, Jesus came to what was his own. But his own people did not receive him. But here what he says next. He says, to all who received him, those who received Jesus Christ. And then he says, those are the ones who believed in his name. Okay? So you receive Jesus, and by receiving Jesus, you believe in his name. Those go hand in hand. So it says there, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that's how faith is important in our lives. Here, it's very clear. Those who receive him are the same ones who believe in him. And once they believe in him, he gives them right to become children of God, to become sons of God. And there you go. So true faith, true faith doesn't really receive things from God. True faith, the first thing it receives is a person. True faith receives Jesus not things. Of course, God blesses us with many blessings here in the world. But every blessing, everything we call blessing, a physical thing, or even a living thing, everything we call blessing, and we receive it before we receive Jesus Christ, it's not a blessing. Because the primary thing that faith receives is a person, and it is Jesus Christ. And that's why I say it, the object of our faith is Jesus Christ himself. He is the one who we, whom we are thinking about when we are thinking about faith. When we are thinking about faith, the primary thing that should come in our mind is not the things that we need, the money, the cars, the houses, husbands and wives. That's not the primary thing that we See, when we open our eyes of faith, the primary thing that we should see when we open our eyes of faith is the person, Jesus Christ. The same gospel in chapter 2. Jesus walks into a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Wine runs out and Jesus is asked by his mother to make some, some, some wine for the wedding. And so Jesus goes ahead and he prepares, he makes, he turns water into wine.
Okay? Now, John tells us in verse 11, John says, Jesus did this as the first of his miraculous signs in the Cana of Galilee. In this way, he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Okay? So Jesus walks into that wedding. There is a need. He provides for that need. But John tells us, in fact, John interprets that miracle for us. What does he say? He says, this was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And in that way, he revealed his glory. And then because he revealed his glory that way, his disciples believed in him. In other words, his disciples had the faith or put their faith in him. And there you go, once again, his disciples put their trust in Jesus Christ. His disciples trusted in him. In other words, his disciples received him. The primary thing that the disciples received was not wine. Because when people talk about this miracle, they talk about how God provided wine, you know, mfinyo, beer for people in a wedding. When people think about this, this miraculous happening, all they think is how Jesus can supply wine. And we miss it. Because right there, the primary thing that the disciples of Jesus Christ received was not the wine. But they received him. They received Jesus Christ. They put their trust in him. They believed in him. A few verses in the same chapter, verse 23, it says there, now, now while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the feast of Passover, many people believed in his name. I say the one belief, the one faith, the verb for faith, belief, appears 98 times in the Gospel of John. We don't have time to go every incident. I'm just mentioning a few here. So here in, in chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus is in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. He does many miracles and many wonders. And it says there that many people believed in his name. In other words, many people put their trust in his name. And then John gives us the reason. He says, because they saw the miraculous signs that he was doing. Okay, but listen to the next line. It says there, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Now, that's very interesting. A very interesting verse there. Many people see the miraculous signs and the wonders that Jesus Christ is performing. And then John tells us, many people believed in his name. But what happens with Jesus? Jesus does not believe in them. So they believe in him because of the miraculous signs and wonders. But because of that, in fact, because they believe in him because of the miracles and wonders, Jesus cannot believe in them. It says there, Jesus would not entrust. The word entrust there is the word believe. So they believe in him because of the miracles. But Jesus does not believe in them because they believe in him as a result of the miracles. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting scenario there. So many people believe in Jesus' name because they have seen the miracles. And it, it happens all over, all over the place. Many people believe in Jesus not because they have known him for who he is. Not because they have an experience with him. No, because they have seen what he can do. He has provided I didn't have food, but God sent someone to bring me food. I didn't have school fees, but God touched someone to, to pay for my school fees. I didn't have a job, but God sent someone and he provided me a job. I, well, I didn't have money to go to hospital, but God sent someone and he paid for my hospital bill. And that way, so many Christians are caught up in this believism which is not as a result of knowing Jesus, experiencing Jesus, encountering Jesus in his gospel. And Jesus says, he cannot believe, because Jesus himself needs to believe. Jesus himself needs to trust. He says, 
I cannot trust myself to a people who trust me because of what I have given them. That's very interesting. He couldn't entrust him, himself to them. In other words, their faith was fake. And we have a lot of fake faith amongst Christians today. A faith that is not true. A faith that is not authentic. A faith that is not based on proper knowledge of who Jesus is. And really, my purpose in this sermon, or in this sermon series, is to help you whoever you are, from whatever you are listening to me, to come back to true faith, a faith that trusts in Jesus, not as a result of what he has done, but as a result of who he is. Because he may do something today, but I cannot promise you that he will do it tomorrow. So if you do not know him, what will your trust be based on? Christians live this kind of life. And there are many people who have received and believed Christ in this manner. They have received, yes, they have said yes to the Lord. They have said, and not a core prayer. They have said, yes, Lord, today I receive you. Forgive me of my sins. And 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 they have made all this, this kind of prayer. They have they have they have asked for forgiveness, but they have only received Jesus as a sin forgiver, and that's all. Because all they love is to be forgiven of their sins and nothing more. That's what they love. That's what they, that's what they want. There are people who receive Jesus as a rescuer, a rescuer from hell. Why? Because people are scared of hell. When they read in Revelation and in the Gospels about hell and the fire that burns without stopping, they get scared, they fear, they run to Jesus, they receive him. But why do they receive him? They don't receive Jesus because they have known him. They receive Jesus because they are scared. That is fake faith. That is not true faith. And there are many people who receive Jesus because he has healed them. <laughs> you know, there are people who love to be healthy. They don't want... They don't want cold. They don't want malaria. They don't want any kind of sickness. Of course, no man loves to be sick. But there are people who will love Jesus, who will receive Jesus because he has healed them. Not because they love him for who he is. And there are many others out there who will love Jesus or who will say, I trust in Jesus because they want the money. They want the pomp. They want the cars. They want the houses. They, and, and when Jesus gives them a bit of that, they are happy. They celebrate. Their faith is magnified. But when you come very close, when you come very near, you realize that they only, they only love Jesus. They only say, I receive you, Jesus. They only say, I put my trust in you because they wanted the money. They wanted the pomp. They wanted the wealthy. Not because they have come to know who Jesus is. And that's why Jesus says there, or that's why John tells us, Jesus could not entrust himself to a people who love him because of things. And if it was true then, it is true now. Listen to me, my viewer. Listen to me, those who are listening to me. If you trust Jesus because of what Jesus gives you, you are a fake Christian. You need to grow. You need to renew. You need to get out of that. That is childishness. You need to grow out of that and come to a place whereby you love him because you know him. You love him because you have an encounter with him. And that is what brings renewal in our lives. It says there, all this, all this did not receive Jesus because he is the only hope. If you receive Jesus because he has given you, he has provided for you, you don't receive him because he is the only hope. You receive him because he has given you things. And let me tell you, the world can also give you those things. 
And if the world can give you those things, it means then, <laughs> if the world gives you those things, then you can choose the world over again as Jesus Christ. So they, so, so they don't deceive Jesus for who he is. God, Lord, Master, King, Redeemer. They don't prize and treasure him for what he is. They don't cherish and delight in him because of who he is. But they delight and cherish in him because of what he can give. And that is idolatry. That is idolatry. Jesus will not entrust himself. Jesus will not entrust his spirit. Jesus will not entrust his gift of faith and repentance to such people because they, are, because they have not yet come to know and to love Jesus for who he is. He will not entrust his gifts, his eternal gifts to them. Renewal is an eternal gift. Revival is an eternal gift. Restoration is an eternal gift. And in moments like this, when things are hard and things are difficult and life is difficult, we need those things. We pray for those things. I want to believe that every Christian is praying, Lord, heal us. Send us revival. Send us healing from heaven so that we can be healed from this pandemic. But let me tell you, if you love Jesus because he has saved you from Corona, what will you do when there is no corona? You will run away from him. You will not love him. You will love the world more than you love Jesus Christ. You need to come to a place whereby you love Jesus for who he is. Not because he's a healer. Not because he gives us wealth and health. And I don't think he even does that. Not because of what he can give us. But because... Of he, who he is. And who is he? He is the Lord. He is the master. He is the one of God. He is the king. He is the one whom we should put our trust in. We, and we should not trust in ourselves. The book of John is very helpful here. Because we have just touched chapter 1, chapter 2. When, when you go to chapter 3, you find a man called Nicodemus. A religious man. A ruler in the synagogue, a Pharisee, he comes to Jesus and John tells us there, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, look at that statement. Sounds wonderful. Sounds like Nicodemus has just had a revelation from heaven of who Jesus is. But I want to tell you that that's just a religious statement in the mouth of Nicodemus. Just like we have so many religious statements about Jesus Christ. We talk about him. We praise him. We call him all sorts of names. My friend. You know, my redeemer. My rescuer. You know. We call him all these kind of names and we praise him. But when we come close and check our faith, we find that our faith is hollow. It, does not, it doesn't have substance. It is not based on a true knowledge of the word of God. It's not based on a true knowledge of who Jesus is. It is a faith just like the faith of Nicodemus. So Jesus could not receive that kind of praise. You know what he said? He said to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I said to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, thank you for your praise. Thank you for your observations. Thank you for your song of praise and worship. But you know what? You are not yet born again. And because you are not born again, you still don't have true faith. You still don't have true dependence. And because of that, you cannot see the kingdom of God. When we continue to read that passage, it says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, Nicodemus, you are still in your flesh. I can hear your language. It's religious language. I can hear your praises. I can hear the way you are talking about me. But the way you are talking about me is not based on true faith. It's not based on true repentance. You are still a man of the flesh. You still need to become a man of the spirit. And then Jesus goes on. Verse 14. He tells Nicodemus, 
as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 15 says, so that whoever believes, that's faith, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And then there goes the verse that everybody loves, including all the Sunday school children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In fact, so many people don't know that that verse was spoken to one man, Nicodemus, one religious man. And what is Jesus trying to communicate to Nicodemus? He is trying to tell him, you must have true faith for you to become a child of God. For you to experience renewal, love the Lord for who he is. You need to be born again. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. Verse 17 says, for God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Verse 18, he who believes in him, once again, I have already said the word believe, the word pistis, that's the Greek word for faith in John appears so many times. And what is this word emphasizing? This word is emphasizing true faith, a faith that trusts in Jesus Christ, not a faith that trusts in what Jesus can do or he cannot do. No, 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 no. That's not faith. True faith has got to do with trusting in the person, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us on the cross, and what he's continuing to do even now, including restoring us, reviving us, so that we may have true faith and true repentance. And so my viewers, I want to encourage you through this series, that for true renewal to happen, for us to experience renewal and revival in our hearts, in our minds, in moments like this, moments of great difficulty, moments of uncertainty, for us to begin to experience God in a new way, one of the prerequisites of that is embracing true faith, a faith that trusts in a person, not what that person can do, a faith that trusts in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, a faith that is anchored in the word of God. A faith that has its encounter with Jesus Christ. We need to return from where religion has sent us. Because what religion has told us is that faith is subjective. And so you will hear people saying, I have faith. I have faith this will happen. I have faith this will happen. I have faith that will happen. I have faith that will happen. And these people never have faith. You will never hear them talking about their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Because faith and trust in Jesus Christ is not dependent on what will happen and what will not happen. That is true faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is a confident assurance that we get from knowing who Jesus is and what he has done for us. That is true faith. And for us to be able to, in, to, in, to, 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 to receive renewal, encouragement, grace to live through what we are going through now, economically, socially, politically, and whichever way you want to define it, for us to be able to experience grace to carry us through during these moments, we must be men and women of faith. We will continue to talk about these two great things, faith and repentance, in our, in our future sessions. But I want to ask you a question. How does your faith look like? John has told us that there are people that Jesus could not trust because the only reason they trusted in him is because he gave, he gave them things, wine and miracles and wonders. But he could not trust them. He could not trust their faith. Is your faith like that? Do you trust Jesus because 
of what he has given you? Or do you trust Jesus for who he is? Whether he has given you something or not. That's a question to ponder. And I pray and hope that you will think about that this week. And then by, by the end of the week, you will come to a place called repentance. Turn from your own way of thinking about faith and embrace Jesus' way. Embrace the biblical way of what faith is. Trusting and believing in Jesus Christ because of who he is. May God bless you. Let me pray and trust God for a great week ahead. Once again, Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you that we can know you, love you, and trust you. Not because of what you give us, but because you are a master, you are a king, you are a redeemer, you are a savior, you rule the world, you're the master of our lives. And so we trust in you. And we pray that by your grace, give us the gift of repentance. To repent from the way we have seen you before. And embrace a new way of trusting in you. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please give your offerings and your gifting gifts and your tithes to the number shown on the screen. Continue um, being a blessing to the work of God as the Lord helps you. May God bless you and give you wealth. Thank you. Make me your thistle.